Vibrant Church, yeah, give it up for the video. Come on, somebody. Well, it's awesome seeing you this morning. My name is Marco Johnson, the lead pastor here, and it is awesome having you with us. Um, before I go into, guess to the message today, guess what this Sunday is? Guess what today is? Anybody know? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, man. This is the day that Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem um, fixing to do what he did for us this next week on, on Friday to give his life for us on the cross. And so that means that next Sunday is obviously Easter Sunday. So we have Palm Sunday this Sunday. Next Sunday we have Easter Sunday. And um, this is what I want to do. I want to encourage you, man, partner with us as a church and invite your friends, invite your family to Easter uh, at Vibrant Church next Sunday because we all know this. We all know of somebody, whether it's a family member, a coworker, a friend that needs to hear the name of Jesus. Well, I want to start off today's message by asking this question, and don't answer it out loud. It could get a little bit weird, so don't answer it out loud. What's the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? Think about that for a second. What's the, the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? How many of you go straight to the shower? Anybody just go, you wake up, you go straight to the shower in here. Anybody? Okay. Got some morning showers. How many go to the coffee pot? you like, it's the first thing. I got to go to the coffee pot. It's like, don't say a word to me until I at least have my coffee. My wife and I, we have a saying in our house, and it's, it's the first cup wakes me up. The second cup makes me smile, and I'm probably not ready to have an in-depth conversation until I'm smiling. So um, I'm definitely that way myself. Um, the most important first thing that I do in the morning, just like I said, is, is I get up and I get my coffee. Because when I get my coffee, my house is a better environment. It's a better environment when Marco gets his coffee. And I would argue this. That the first thing that you do in the morning is the most important thing that you do. How many of y'all could probably agree? Okay, the first thing I do is probably the most important thing that I do because it, it sets my day on the correct pace. Have you ever woke up in the morning if you're a coffee or a tea drinker and you ran out of coffee the last round you made and you forgot about that and you're like, oh no, I got to make a McDonald's run. I got to go to Starbucks. I got to get my coffee. I got to get my tea. See, the most important thing that you do is the first thing that you do in the morning. And I think we could all agree on that. For example, I think we could all agree that the majority of us approach life with an order of importance. The most important thing that I do before I leave my house is to make sure I have three things. Anybody know what those three things are? Maybe you do this too. Your phone, your wallet, and your keys. It's like I'm walking out the door. Okay, my phone, I got my phone, my wallet, my keys, my phone, my wallet, my keys. And I've kind of went to the next step. I actually have a phone now that keeps all my cards in there. So I've combined two in one, you know, so I just got to, okay, my phone, my wallet, my, okay, my keys. Um, and then how about this one? Before I walk out here to speak, guess what the most important thing I do is? Yes, I pray. I do that. But the most important thing that I do is check my zipper about a million times before I walk out. <laughs> and there's a story behind that. Because whenever I was a youth pastor, man, I was doing this school assembly, and, and I was preaching to these teenagers, man, just tearing it up for Jesus. And as I'm preaching, you know, I'm like, man, this is going good. Hundreds of teenagers are going to give their life to Jesus, man. And I give the altar call, and all these teenagers come up here, and, you know, they're like throwing their weed out, you know. They're throwing this out. They're like, I, I repent. I come to Jesus, you know. And I'm like, yeah, man, in Jesus' name, this is awesome. And then the event ends, and this kid comes up to me. And I'm thinking he's coming up to me to be like, man, Marco, that was so awesome. You know, that was just, you really brought the word. My life's been changed. But he comes up to me, and he didn't say nothing. He just goes, hey, yo, Marco, your fly's open, bro. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know. And so now, any time I get up to speak, I check my zipper about a million, million times. That's the most important thing that I do. Again, we all have an order of importance for things in our life. With that in mind, let me ask you this question. What is the most important thing for the church to focus on? What is the most important thing that we're supposed to focus on in Christianity? See, if you ask 100 different people that question, guess what? 
you're going to get a hundred different answers. I've heard all kinds of answers to this question. For example, some people say, man, it's politics. Politics. The, The church should be focused on politics. Politics is what the church should be immersed in. We should be holding politicians accountable. We should pass out voter registrations in the church, voters' guides in the church. We should bring Christian politicians in to speak on Sunday. Now, let me say this. I love when godly politicians are in office. I, I, I pray for our country personally. I pray for our politicians. I pray for our president. I pray for our country. But at the end of the day, our politicians are just a pawn in the hands of a sovereign God who is using them to get the world ready for his son to come back. See, I believe that everyone has an opinion in our culture, but I also believe because of that, man, even followers of Jesus, we should have an opinion. But more importantly, man, we should be praying for our politicians. We should be praying for our country. We should be praying that everyone on this planet, everyone in our country will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. So let's not put our hope in a pawn on a chessboard. Yes, vote. Yes, be involved in politics. But don't make your political party mainstream Christianity for the rest of the world. Others think the most important thing in the church we should focus on is this, is morality. They think we should be walking around telling everyone how they should live their lives, even if it means being rude and ugly. How many of y'all met somebody? How many of you know somebody like that? It's like, man, they kind of the sin police. You know, they're walking around to people who aren't even Christians, and they're like, you sin it. And the sinner's like, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I do. I'm a sinner. I'm a shep's gonna, she, shepherd's going to shep, usher's going to us, sinner's going to sin. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's what they do. You know people like that. How many of y'all like being around people that are the sin police? I don't. I know. We don't. We don't. I've I've yet to see somebody that came to Jesus because they got in an argument with somebody. I've yet to see somebody come to Jesus because Jesus was forced down their throat. Always remember this. It's our job as followers of Jesus to love people. It's God's job to change people. It's God's job to change people. See, Jesus didn't model finger-pointing Christianity for us. See, Jesus, he could have had a ministry of no. He could have had a ministry of just no. He could have walked around going, no, 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 no. Hey, you knock it off. I know what you did last night. I know what you two did last week. I know what you did last summer. Some of y'all remember that movie? I know what you did last summer. And I know what you're going to be doing when you leave church today. He could have had the ministry of no. No, no, no. You all going to hell, no. But that's not who he was, and that's not who he is. See, we've also seen Christians in our culture get together and decide to boycott non-Christian organizations for acting like non-Christian organizations. (laughs) When's the last time you saw a non-Christian give their heart to Jesus because you opposed them? Never. Again, our job is to love people. It's God's job change people. See, boycotting a non-Christian organization for doing non-Christian things is like walking out in the parking lot, seeing a duck, and that duck quacking at you and going, you idiot! Why did you quack at me? (laughs) Ducks quack. Sinners sin. And it's not our job as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as a church, to go boycott non-Christian organizations. Again, It's our job to love people. It's God's job to change people. Now, let me say this. As Christians, we are called to a higher standard, but we're called to model that standard, not condemn the people that don't live up to our standard. I'm going to say that again. As Christians, we're called to live to a higher standard. We're called to model that standard, not to condemn people that don't live up to that standard. See, the majority of finger-pointing morality Christians I know need to clean up some area in their own house. Whoa, well, preach it, preacher. (laughs) Now, other people think the church should be focused on social injustice. See, I'm all about social injustice. The fact that nearly 30 million people worldwide are involved in human trafficking, it bothers me. 
my wife and I have actually financially supported different organizations, different Christian ministries that fight human trafficking. We, we believe in going and uh, providing social justice for social injustices. But let me say this. Social, social justice without the gospel is eternal injustice. Social justice without Jesus provides temporary relief without true freedom. So you got social justice. Others say the most important thing in the church should be self-preservation. It should be about us four and no more. As long as we take care of ourselves, we're going to go buy some land in some distant corner of the U.S., man, and we're going to build like this, like, camp out type thing, man, this compound, and, man, we're going to put a big old fence up around it, and, man, the Bible's going to be at the center of it. Jesus is going to be at the center of it, man. We're going to self-preserve, and, man, nobody from the outside is going to be allowed in because we got to preserve what's going on. It's us four and no more, but we all know the truth about that. That's never what Jesus intended. If that would have been what Jesus intended and he would have equipped the disciples to do that, guess what? We wouldn't have the church today. You and I would not know Jesus. We would not be gathering here today as a vibrant church to worship our Father in heaven, to worship our God. So what is it? What is the most important thing in Christianity? What's the most important thing in Christianity? Well, if you have your Bibles with you, Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to answer that question. See, the Apostle Paul, he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, and we met Paul in week one. If you remember that, we met Paul. He, he, um, he was a murderer of Christians, and by the time he writes this book in 1 Corinthians, he is now a converter of people to Christianity. So we see Paul went from a murderer to a converter. He went from Killing Christians to, hey, y'all need to hear this message. You need to hear this message of Jesus because this message of Jesus has changed my life. And he became a converter of people to Christianity. See, Paul, he, he, he went from hopeless to hope. He went from hurting to healed. That's what God does. Only God can bring hope and healing to the worst situations. There's no other name. There is no other name. Maybe you're here and you feel hopeless. Maybe you're here and you've, you're hurting. You've been wounded. You come in this door maybe with a smile on your face, but your heart is very heavy. This is what I want you to know. There's no other name than the name of Jesus by which you can receive hope, by which you can be healed, and by which you can be saved. See, as Paul grew in his walk with God, he started planting churches. And as he planted churches, he would write letters to those churches. And what's interesting is this. He wrote more information to the church of Corinth than any other church. Again, we're going to 1 Corinthians. Paul wrote more letters to this church than any other church combined, more than he did to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, and to the Colossians. Why did Paul write so much to the Corinthians? Why? If you read the letters... You pick it up real quick. The Corinthians were jacked up. (laughs) The Corinthians had mega problems. There were problems. And so he would write a letter and then be like, man, they still didn't listen. And then he would write another letter and a long letter. And they still wouldn't listen. But see, 1 Corinthians 15.3, it says this. For what I receive... I passed on to you. Hold that there one second. See, in this letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, Paul defines for us, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what the most important thing for his church to be focused on. And this is it right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For what I received, for what I received, I passed on to you. Did you know this? Your purpose involves other people. Your purpose, we, we as followers of Jesus have to go from a consumer to a contributor. We have to go from being on the sidelines to actually getting in the game and telling people about Jesus, sharing what God did with our life. He says, for what I've received, I passed on to you. 1 Corinthians 3, it goes on to say this. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Marco, what's the most important thing that we should be doing as followers of Jesus? 
I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins. What's the most important thing in Christianity? It's not how much you know. It's not how well you know the Bible. It's not how long you've been going to church. It's this. Christ died for me. Yet when I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Now I want to pause there for a moment. If you're here and you're a non-believer, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. We've built this church with you in mind. This is a safe place for you to come and ask your questions. But I do want to ask you this question. If you're a non-believer, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? Not, I read some book and it bothered me so I don't believe in God. Or, a Christian was mean to me, welcome to the crowd. So I don't believe in God. Um, I had to take, I'll just say this, I've had to take hits uh, from people I never thought I would have had to take hits from. And they've done it to me. And there's some things in the church as a whole that bother me too, if you're a non-believer here. But the question you have to answer as a non-believer is, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? Because there really was a man named Jesus that died on the cross for you and for me so that you can go to heaven and not live like hell on earth. Did you know this? God doesn't want to just give you a free pass in Jesus to to now go to heaven. He doesn't want you to have to live like hell on earth either. And when we we begin to soak in the Bible, when we begin to seek God, all of a sudden what seems like hell here on earth, God somehow, some ways begins to transform your life. And not that it's perfect, not that it's easy, but man, it's better. Life is just better with Jesus. He brings hope to the hopeless and healing to the hurting. But the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Well, Marco, I, I don't believe in the Bible. That's cool. Hey, if you're a non-believer in here and you don't believe in the Bible, I totally, totally respect your belief. But if that's the case, then let us talk about the writings of Josephus. Let us talk about the writings of a Roman historian, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger. Let's let's talk about the writings all throughout history that agree, they, they just agree. All these writings agree that there was a man named Jesus that was born between 4 and 6 B.C., that he lived 33 years on this earth and died at the hands of a Roman government by crucifixion. It's not just the Bible. There's other writings out there that show that. And the reality is, is you don't have to be a a Christian. That's up to you. That's up to you if you want to be a follower of Jesus. But we do. We all have to do something with Jesus. So the Bible tells us that Christ died, and there's a reason that he died. Now, if you're a Christian, this is, the, this is the time that you want to lean into this message. Because here's the reason that Christ died. Here it is. He died for our sins, which we all have. We are all a sinner in need of a Savior. At Vibrant Church, we don't pretend to be a perfect church because there is no perfect church. We strive and we pray and we love to be a genuine church. That's our hope. And that's what I ask you to do as the body of Christ. When you walk out of these doors, strive to be that genuine person. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. There's going to be relational things that are going to go on. There's going to be things that happen in your life. There's going to be choices that you make that, man, you, you regret and you wish you could take back. But, man, always keep your eyes focused on God. Always keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And try to be that genuine person, genuinely loving people the way that he's called us to love them. But here's the reason that Christ died. He died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15.3, it says, What I received, I pass on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins. The reason this is important for those of us who call ourselves Christians is because we can get so immersed in church culture that we think we're awesome. (laughs) We just think we're awesome. And then we look down on other people. And we start saying things like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they do that because I do this. All while thinking, I kind of got it going on. I'm showing up early. I'm serving. I'm getting, I am getting it. I'm just bringing it. People get saved. Boy, this is amazing. I'm just, I'm the, I'm anointed. I mean, I just, I'm so annoyed. You, eh, you'll get there. That's not, hey, not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Me, I know. 
I'm moving on. <laughs> See, if we're not careful as Christians, we can become arrogant and prideful. And what are the two things that got Satan kicked out of heaven? Arrogance and pride. See, when we succumb to pride, when it's our way or the highway, there's, there's no other way, or uh, I always got to be, you know, just, just pride. We, we all know what pride looks like. Let me say this. The Bible says in James 4, 6 that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This isn't in the notes. This one's free today. <laughs> God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When we get filled with pride, guess what God does? He opposes us. Guess what people do? They oppose you. Guess what Satan does automatically, whether you're prideful or humble? He opposes you. So when you walk around prideful and arrogant, guess what happens? All of a sudden, you go from one to ha- having one enemy to having three. That's what happens when we become. That's why we have to humble ourselves. We have to walk humbly, not succumbing to arrogance and pride. But if we keep our mind wrapped around the fact that Jesus died for our sins, it'll remind us that we're all on the same playing field. We're all sinners in need of a Savior, no matter our circumstances, rich or poor, good or bad, young or old. You know this? We all have the same purpose, just different roles. We all have the same purpose. It's to love God, love people, reach people for Jesus. That's my purpose. We just have different roles. Some people's role is, man, being the greeter. Some people's role, role is to be out in the business world, reaching people for Jesus, man. Some people's role is to be up here on a Sunday talking to you. We all have the same purpose. We're all called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We just have different roles in the body of Christ. So here's what's important. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and on the third day, not on day one or day two, but on the third day, he was resurrected from the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Check this out. Paul approaches the Corinthians and says, Jesus died for you. Then he goes on to say this. He was buried, that he was raised from the third day according to Scripture. According to Scripture. See, on day one, check this out. This is awesome. This is awesome. On day one, he was still in the grave. We could all agree on that. On day two, he was still in the grave. We could all agree on that. His body was in the tomb. Been there. Seen the tomb. It's amazing. It's awesome. But on day three, what happened? He was resurrected. He was resurrected from the dead. He, the, the people went to the tomb, and they saw that Jesus was no longer there. In 2010, I went to that tomb, and I poked my head in it, and I saw a sign that says, he is written. Jesus is no longer in the grave. He was there on day one. He was there on day two. But on the third day, and this is what's important, he rose. See, God is in the business of resurrecting dead things and breathing life into them. Maybe you have something in your life right now. It seems dead. There seems no hope. You've tried. You've tried to push your way through. You've tried to muscle your way through. God is saying, hold on, time out. You're on day one. You're on day two. But let me tell you something. Day three is coming. Your day three is coming. It's coming. Marco, it's not working out. You're still on day one. Marco, I want this to happen in my life. You're still on day two. Are you seeking God? Are you trusting God? Because if you are... Your day one may be here, your day two, but your day three is coming. See, the third day always comes. The third day comes in your life. That's why we say we're a church of of hope and healing. Hope for tomorrow and healing from yesterday because day three always comes. See, God is going to bring life to your seemingly dead situation. The Bible goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, check this out. This is what's important, that he appeared to Cephas. So on day three, he rose from the grave, and then after he rose from the grave, the Bible says that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the 12, and after that, check it out, he appeared. You see that bolded, that's important. He appeared, and then it goes on to say he appeared to more than 500. Remember that word, or remember that 500. Say 500 with me, 500. Remember that, 500. He appeared to 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared, there's the key word again, key phrase, he appeared to James, and then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Abnormally born. See, there's something different about Christianity. 
There's a reason we say there is no other way to heaven. There's a reason that we say there's no other name by which we can be saved. Because Jesus was murdered on a cross, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose from the grave. And that's the reason we have hope and, peating, hope and, hope and healing. Now let me put my cards on the table for everyone in this room. Let me just put my cards on the table. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That's what I believe. And it's not something I kind of believe. It's something that I've given my life for. Is that I believe that I know what my life was like the day before I gave my heart to Jesus. I know the hell that I was in. And I know what Jesus came into my life and did by setting me free. When I gave my heart to Jesus, literally, I walked outside. The sky was bluer. The grass was greener. The trees were taller. And it felt like a thousand pounds of bricks were lifted off of my shoulder. That's what Jesus Christ does. That's what he does. And every once in a while, I'll hear someone say, that's my problem with Christianity. You're not tolerant. You say Jesus is the only way. And you guys are exclusive. And that bothers me. Check this out. Did you know that every other religion in the world claims exclusivity? Every other religion claims they're the only way. Buddhists say they're the only way. Muslims say they're the only way. Hindus say they're the other way. They're the only way. Every religion claims they're the only way. And so does Christianity. But what's the difference between Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, and Christians? It's the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Muhammad is still in the grave. But when we go to the tomb of Jesus, guess what? We don't see a body anymore. We see a declaration that he's not here, he's risen, he's alive. And we have hope because of that. Now we know Easter is right around the corner. And every year at this time, some scientist on the History Channel, with more degrees than a thermometer, after his name, comes on and tries to explain how the resurrection could have happened. And, and here's some of the arguments. Number one is this. People were just hallucinating. Okay, people were just hallucinating, huh? Okay. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you know what it's like to hallucinate because I know some of y'all's story in here. Some of y'all probably hallucinating right now. Y'all like, Marco, there's a purple ninja right next to you. Don't move. Don't move. Stay still, bro. He's going to cut you at your knees. He's going to cut you at your knees. <laughs> if that's you, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. But see, here's the problem about this argument. What is the number that I asked you to remember earlier? 500. 500. Good class. Awesome. <laughs> it is medically and scientifically impossible for 500 people to have the exact same hallucination. Trust me, I've done it. I've been there. For those of you who don't know my story, I'm an ex-drug dealer from Houston that got rocked when I was 20 years old, and I've never looked back to serving Jesus since then. And I know what it's like to hallucinate. And whenever we would get in the room and we would bust out the shrooms and different things like that, guess what? We all had different hallucinations. Some of my friends were walking out of the room going, dude, I see dead people. Me, I'm like, whoa, everything looks like a cartoon. None of us had the exact same hallucination. It's scientifically and medically impossible. The second argument is this. The disciples stole the body. They stole it. They stole the body, man. They went in there, boop, right underneath the guard. Popped out the body, had like, what was that, Bur Bernie something, you know, somewhere with Bernie. You know? uh, and they started doing that. Uh, I know I just slaughtered that, but you get the point. Here's the problem that if the disciples stole the body, here's the problem. After the death of Jesus, what do we see the disciples doing in Scripture? Let's go to the Bible. What do we see the, the disciples doing in Scripture? They were hiding in a room, huddled together because they were scared the Romans had just killed their leader on a cross, and they thought they were next. So they're in a room. They're, like, freaking out. Like, oh, uh, dude, like, I'm chunking the deuce at you, man. Let me give you a hug. Okay, another hug. High five's cool. I may never see you again. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm scared. Again, here's the problem with that. Anything you're scared of, you don't typically run near. Roman soldiers were guarding the tomb. Any contact with a Roman soldier meant they were a dead person. How can the disciples steal 
the body if they're scared to even go near the tomb. Here's the third argument. The Roman slash Jewish officials stole the body. This is a good one right here. Yeah, the Romans, the, the, the Romans, you know, the Roman guards, the, the Jews, they stole the body. Here's the problem with this argument. Here's the problem with this myth. There was no one more opposed to the idea of Jesus and Christianity than the Romans or the Jews. All you have to do is read through the book of Acts and watch how many times the Romans and the Jews tell those that believe in Jesus to stop talking about Jesus. The Romans and the Jews were like, they didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want Jesus next to them. They were like, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Shut that Jesus thing down so that we can remain the rulers of the world. So would it, would it have made more sense for the Romans and the Jews to parade the dead body of Jesus around saying, look, he's dead, instead of hiding the body? If I'm a Roman or a Jew, I'm, I'm walking this body around, like I'm pulling this thing on a cart saying, hey, look, your, your quote unquote savior, he's dead. But they couldn't do that because he had risen from the grave. He wasn't stolen. He went to the tomb and he rose from the dead so that you and me could have eternal life. Which leads us to number four. Jesus did not die. He just passed out. <laughs> this is the things that happen. <laughs> he didn't die, dude. The brother just passed out. Okay. To medically look at what Jesus went through is horrendous. We can all agree on that. He went through two, possibly three beatings. You can, you can argue three, possibly. He's bleeding to death. Skin's hanging from his body. He's crucified. Arteries and veins are crushed. And he dies of suffocation and loss of blood. Romans that were experts at killing people pronounce him dead. Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke was a doctor, pronounced him dead. John, who was there, pronounced him dead. But some scientists believe that the cold, cool air of the tomb somehow revived him. Somehow Jesus unwrapped his mummified body, or however they did it, and, and pushed off 75 pounds of burial spices that were on top of him, and then rolled away the tomb... And then walk past the Roman guards. Like, oh, yeah, your spears? No. Y'all cool. I don't, I'm cool. No, I'm just going to walk out of here. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't need to come at me with those. You just pierce me right here. I'm good. You did your damage. You know, so they didn't do that. Why? Because Jesus was no longer in the grave. Jesus died. He was buried. And he resurrected from the grave on the third day. That's why followers, as followers of Jesus, we can have hope and we can rejoice. See, check this out. Resurrection equals rejoicing. The resurrection, we, if you can wrap your head around this fact, we serve a God that came here to earth fully man, fully God. He lived a sinless life. He was perfect. And he was murdered for you and me. And as he hung there on the cross, every sin that you and me would ever commit, he bore there on the cross. Imagine the weight of that. I know what it's like whenever I sin and the weight of that. You do too. But he carried every single weight, every single sin of the earth there as he hung on the cross for you and for me. And he suffocated and bled to death on that cross. They took him down. They put him in a tomb. There he laid. But then on the third day, he was resurrected. He was resurrected. And it's because of that, you and me can rejoice. On our worst day, trust me, we have bad days. I know, I get it. I have bad days. You have bad days. But even on those bad days, remember what your life was like the day before you gave your heart to Jesus. Just remember Gosh, I can rejoice that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. My name is written in heaven. Praise God. My name is written in heaven. This is why a Christian that finds out they have cancer can raise their hands and worship their God. Because they know that despite their circumstances, God is good. That's why when a Christian is having a tough time in their marriage, 
They don't look for a way out. They look for a way through. That's why a Christian that loses everything can still sing praises to their Jesus because he's all that they need. Some of you in here, you've lost everything. You know that feeling of losing everything. You know the feeling of losing a parent. You know the feeling of losing a child. But Jesus is all that you need. He's all that you need. <laughs> and you can rejoice in that. This leads to the second part. The resurrection equals responsibility. Let me ask you this question. What have you given your life for? What have you given your life for? Have you given your life for your career? Have you given your life for your kids? What have you given your life for? See, we have a responsibility to tell people about this because every person in this room has a friend, a family member that's lost. Let me grab this card. Everyone in this room, we have a friend or a family member that's lost. They don't know Jesus and we have the responsibility to tell them the greatest news in the world. The greatest news in the world is that there's an empty tomb. It's the most important thing in Christianity. And the Jesus that was resurrected from the dead will come into your heart today. He'll power wash your soul and give you a new life. Not a pain-free life, but a life of freedom. So this is what I want us to do as a church. I want us to get serious about Easter Sunday. I beg you serious about Easter Sunday. Next Sunday, and invite as many people as you possibly can to come with you. Again, every number has a name. Every name has a story. And every story matters to God. And this is what I can guarantee you on Easter. I'm going to work on my message as hard as I can. I can guarantee you that. The gospel of Jesus will be preached. Hope will be proclaimed and Jesus will change lives. So let's get serious about next Sunday. And what we've done as a church is we wanna partner with you. We wanna help you. And we just have a little tool here to help you kind of think through some people to invite. And this is an Easter Vibrant Church invite card or, or list card. And you see on here, one invite could change someone's life. How many of you were invited to church in here? Raise your hand for me if you were invited to church. How many of you, your life was changed by Jesus? Raise your hand. Amen. Somebody invited you to church, your life was changed. There's people out in our community that need to be invited. They need to hear the message of Jesus. And so here's five, you may have more, but you can take this home, physically write the names of those people down here. This is what I want you to do. Pray over these names and personally invite them to come to Easter at Vibrant Church. We'll do it. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Father, we praise you. You are good. You are powerful, Father. And for every person here, God, I pray that, that names would come to mind of people that need to hear about Jesus, people that are hopeless, people that are helpless, people that are hurting, God. Remind us throughout this week as we get in conversations that we just invite people and bring them to hear the message. If you're here today and, and you say, you know what, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I want to. I want to give my life to him. I've never done it before, but I want to give my life to him. This is what I'm going to ask you to do boldly. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and then I'm going to simply pray a prayer with you. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but I want you to make that bold representation before God and raise your hand if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior on the count of three. One, Two, three. Raise your hand in here. Okay. All right. And this is what I want to do as well. If you're in here and, and you've, you know that you're not in the right place with God, you know that you need to get right with God, we're going to pray this prayer together. And if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you want to recommit your life to Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Father. Let's pray together as a church. Say, Father. I come before you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Bring hope where I'm hopeless. Bring healing where I'm hurting. Today, 
I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.